Hi, so welcome back to another lecture. We're going to now discuss the, uh, the anatomy and the physiology of the respiratory system. So the respiratory system is going to involve several different structures that are going to involve the, uh, the exchange of material, uh, specifically different gases, um, between our environment and our blood and then between our blood and our tissues. So that exchange which is occurring between our uh, environment, so the air that ultimately enters our lungs and our cap and our uh, alveoli, going into our capillaries, we're going to call that external respiration. And then when we carry that oxygen in our blood down to our tissues and our cells, the exchange between the blood and the cells or the tissues, we'll call that internal respiration. Okay. So if you think about what's occurring between external respiration and internal respiration, it's just circulation. So uh, blood circulating from the lungs back to the heart and then from the heart out to our body. So that'll involve our pulmonary and our systemic um, circuits. So here we can see just a basic uh, representation of what is occurring during external respiration and what we have during internal respiration. So with external you have material and gases being exchanged between the alveolar capillaries and the alveolus and in internal you have it being exchanged between the blood and our cells and tissues. So the anatomy of the respiratory system, you can really start in two places. You can start in your nose or your mouth, and then you'll work down through some of these different areas. So we'll have our pharynx, our larynx, our trachea, our bronchi and bronchioles, and then ultimately our down into our, our lungs, and then those lungs will be associated with our uh, pleurae. So we'll have a parietal and a visceral pleura, and we'll talk about those as well. So our nose is oftentimes the best um, place to breathe in air. Now I say best lightly because bringing air in through the mouth is also fine, but when air comes in through the nose you have a, you have some degree of filtration that is occurring. So this can really help to filter out any uh, dust or other debris that may be present uh, within the air that we're, that we're uh, inhaling. So we will bring in air through our external nares here, so these openings. So if we have an external, we probably have an internal, and that's exactly what we'll see. Uh, it'll then enter into the nasal vestibule, and then it'll go back ultimately into our uh, nasopharynx if we are talking about uh, bringing in air through our nose. So here we can see our nose, and now generally in, in skulls and anatomical models, this, this outer portion will not be present because this is cartilage, and so we have a, we have a cartilage aspect of our nose as well as a bony aspect uh, with our septum here. Uh, you have your uh, external nares here, and then this koana, this is really kind of our internal nair. So you know that this is here if you've ever um, drank some liquid or eaten something and then laughed or uh, somehow inhaled really quickly and that, that ingested material will come uh, up and out of your nose. So it's passing back through this uh, nasal koana or this internal nair and coming from your oral pharynx and nasal pharynx out, uh, out your nose. Now on the right here we can see different concha. These concha are formed by these turbinate bones and you see you have a superior, a middle, and an inferior. And what these are, these are projections off the medial kind of nasal septum and they serve to increase surface area and they're lined with uh, mucosa and epithelium to filter, uh, filter the air that's coming in through our nose. Uh, if you think about these bones, you can see that these two here are attached and this one down here is not attached. So this inferior nasal concha, this is really going to be its own bone. And then the superior and the middle, these are going to be part of the ethmoid bone uh, that kind of makes up some of this anterior portion uh, of our skull. Now, between these um, conchae, so the superior, middle, and inferior, just beneath one of them, you have a meatus or meati uh, for plural. So beneath the superior conchae, you have the superior meatus. Beneath the middle concha, you have the middle meatus, and beneath the inferior, you have the inferior meatus. These are just little passageways which air can flow through, and we'll also talk about, talk about some of our uh, nasal sinuses, our paranasal sinuses, and the mucus and the products secreted in those will drain into our different meati. Now, uh, one, one thing that you will be able to relate to is when you cry, you have your lacrimal gland, and your lacrimal gland will secrete tears that will ultimately drain into lacrimal canaliculi and then into a lacrimal sac and a lacrimal duct, a nasal lacrimal duct. And that will drain into this inferior meatus. And so really this is why you are uh, developing a runny nose and are 
sniffling during times in which you're crying. The tears are essentially draining into your uh, nasal cavity through this uh, inferior meatus, and then that's what results in a runny nose during periods of crying. So within our nose, we have different types of, of epithelium and different uh, mucosa with associated epithelium. So you have an olfactory epithelium that'll pertain to our sense of smell. So that's going to involve our first cranial nerve, the olfactory nerve, that will detect chemical stimuli in our environment, and then that will be interpreted as a smell in our brain. And then we have a respiratory mucosa with that ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium. And so that is really the epithelium that appears to be stratified, but it's not. So if it's not stratified, it has to be simple. So just a single layer, all of the cells touch the basement membrane, but they appear to be stratified. So we call it pseudo or falsely stratified. And then a unique feature of these, they have cilia on top. With cilia are those small hair-like projections. And what these cilia do is they serve to um, beat rhythmically and move mucus and different products kind of out of the way. We'll also see this epithelium in our trachea. And here cilia will act as a mucociliary escalator to move different types of uh, products. With, so mucus with, with trapped foreign debris and, and dust particles help to move it up and out of the trachea into our pharynx where we can either, uh, we can either swallow it or we can choose to spit it out. So that, that's what we'll call a mucociliary escalator. We also have goblet cells associated with our respiratory mucosa, and we'll see goblet cells in there. They're somewhat of a clear, more kind of ovoid-shaped cell that secrete mucus. So here we can see our respiratory and our olfactory mucosa, just a basic uh, depiction. And then here you can see our ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium. So you can note that all of these are touching the basement membrane. Now, it may not be incredibly obvious that they are, um, but all of them will touch this basement membrane down here. One way you can tell this type of tissue apart is the level of the nuclei. They'll be staggered. So you have a nucleus down here, then you have another one way up here, way down here, and they're, they're staggered all throughout. Whereas if you had true simple columnar, all of the nuclei would be roughly in, a, uh, in alignment. You can see a large mucus secreting goblet cell here, and then you can see the cilia on the apical surface of this uh, epithelium. So associated with our nose, kind of around our nose, we have our paranasal sinuses. And we have four of them, uh, four, four general ones. Some of them are, are paired. Um, and these are named according to the bone in which they reside. So it's really easy to remember them. Uh, all of them are lined with mucosa that secrete mucus. And they have uh, certain innervations largely due to... Uh, innervation by cranial nerves um, that allow them to have um, uh, parasympathetic innervation. But uh, what you have are your frontal sinuses, your maxillary, ethmoidal, and sphenoidal. Now they're named for the bones that they reside in. So the frontal resides in the frontal bone, maxillary in the maxilla, ethmoidal in the ethmoid bone, and the sphenoidal in the sphenoid bone. So here you can see on the right a rough uh, schematic of where these are located and then on the left side you can see an x-ray image that shows these. Now the frontal is very easy to see and the maxillary is very easy to see. The, uh, the ethmoid is not as clear and they sometimes these are called ethmoid air cells. And then your sphenoidal sinus, a great landmark to find this is to find your cella tersica, so where that pituitary gland sits and you can see that right here, this shallow depression. And if you look just anterior to that and kind of inferior you'll see this hollow space that is your sphenoid sinus. So you can see the same thing on this drawing. You find the cella tersica, the hypophysial fossa of the cella tersica, and just go just anterior and inferior to that, and you'll find your sphenoid sinus. Now, we'll talk about how we bring things in to our uh, mouth. So when we're talking about air, it can either come in through our nose or our mouth. And then when we talk about ingested things, so food, foodstuffs, and liquid, uh, it can come in, uh, we generally think about it coming in through our mouth. Now, this common passageway that can have air associated with our respiratory system and food and liquid associated with our digestive system, this region is called our pharynx. And then we can further divide our pharynx into three more subdivisions uh, based on what it is associated with. So this is going to be your nasal pharynx, closely associated with your uh, nose or your nasal region. You can have your oral pharynx associated with your oral cavity, and then your laryngopharynx associated with your larynx. Now, all three of these can contain ingested material, so food and liquid, as well as air. 
Now, here you can see a sagittal section, and then this is a posterior view looking anterior. So you can see general area of where your nasopharynx is, your oropharynx, and your laryngopharynx. From your laryngopharynx, you can either go anterior into your trachea, or you will go posterior into your esophagus. And you can see a very similar thing uh, here, just a posterior view. You can see some of those nasal conchae that we talked about earlier, how they project, um, project inward. This would be your glottis, the opening to your trachea. This is your epiglottis. And then your uh, esophagus would be located just posterior to that. So here we can see, same thing, you can, we can see our nasopharynx, our oropharynx, and our laryngopharynx. And with it, we can see associated uh, tonsils that we'll talk about with our, um, uh, that, that we've mentioned with our lymphatic and immune systems. So you can see a pharyngeal tonsil, your palatine tonsil, and your uh, lingual tonsil associated with your with your tongue. Now, the pharynx that we just covered, it can contain both air and ingested material, so food and liquid. Now with our larynx, it will only contain air. Okay, so this is now getting into our, uh, associated with our, only our respiratory system. It is just uh, superior to our trachea, so as the larynx continues inferiorly, we run into our trachea. Within our larynx, this is what will gen is generally uh, referred to as your voice box. You have several different cartilages, and these cartilages are associated with our vocal cords. Uh, these cartilages are attached to muscle, and then the cartilages are also attached to the vocal cords. So as the muscles contract, they move these cartilages. As the cartilages move, they move the vocal cords. And as air is moving through uh, this space, it is uh, what ultimately results in the production of sound. And so we have several. We have epiglottis, we have a thyroid cartilage, we have a cricoid cartilage, and then we have several paired ones. So we have retinoid, corniculate cartilages, and cuneiform cartilages. Now, of our, we also have some tracheal cartilage as well, which if you feel on the base of your neck, just beneath your thyroid cartilage, that large projection that you can feel in your neck, just beneath that, you can feel all your uh, tracheal cartilages, your tracheal rings. Now, the only one of all these that makes a complete circle, a complete ring, is your cricoid cartilage. Okay, So your thyroid cartilage does not, and your tracheal cartilages do not. And then your thyroid cartilage does not as well. Uh, so the cricoid cartilage will be the only one that makes a complete circle, a complete ring uh, in our larynx. So. Here we can see the general area of where our larynx is going to be. We can see the uh, vocal cords. And then here we can see our different cartilages. So they're on this left image, they are colored and they have a key on the right. And then here you can see the same thing. So we can see our epiglottis. We can see our thyroid cartilage. And this is one you can feel very easily on yourself. And then the little point that has a little depression that you can feel, this little middle portion, this is specifically your laryngeal prominence, which is oftentimes referred to as your Adam's apple. You can see our paired cartilages as well, so your cuneiform, corniculate, and our uh, arytenoid cartilages. And then you can see your cricoid cartilage. So this is the one that will make a complete, uh, a complete ring uh, encircling the trachea. Now, our larynx will be associated with our vocal cords, which we'll call our true vocal, uh, a vocal fold, which we'll call our true vocal cords, and then our vestibular folds, which will be our false vocal cords. The vestibular folds are going to be located just superior to our uh, true vocal cords, so our vocal folds. And these will interact with the cartilages and the muscles in the area to ultimately result in the production of sound. So as we can see here, muscles are going to attach to our retinoid cartilages, as those move, they move our vocal cords, or our true vocal folds here, and then that will ultimately result in sound production. So what you can see here is you can see your uh, vestibular folds here. You can see true vocal folds here. These would be attached to our uh, retinoid cartilages back here. And as those cartilages move, they will pull on these uh, vocal cords, and this will result in either it becoming larger, so as you can see on the left, or smaller and closed here on the right to result in sound production. Now, here we can see the same thing. So we can see our cuneiform, which is really embedded in this, uh, this membrane here. You can see a vestibular fold, 
located more superiorly uh, to the true vocal cord here, which we'll call our vocal fold. You can also see your corniculate cartilage as well as your arytenoid cartilage. Now your, your arytenoid cartilage has some, some more parts, so it has a, a muscular process and a, and a vocal process. The muscular process is where many muscles will attach, and as those muscles contract, they move on, they pull the cartilage. As the cartilage moves, it pulls the vocal cords, and this results in sound production. So here's just a brief uh, kind of drawing, a schematic showing what's happening as our cartilage are being moved. So these are going to be our retinoids, these kind of triangular shape. This long, skinny structure, these are going to be our uh, vocal cords. And then we'll have muscles located back here on our arytenoid cartilages. So as a muscle moves, and you can see it down here, it's either moving um, inward or uh, this is moving down and in, and this is moving up and out. So this will result in either an increase in the size of the glottis, the opening, or a decrease in the size of the glottis right here. So that will close them. Now, different muscles in the larynx will produce different uh, movements. You don't have to worry about the muscles. Just know that as these arytenoid cartilages are moving uh, via the contraction of the muscles, it's moving the true vocal cords or our vocal folds, and this will increase the size of the glottis or decrease the size. So here's a video that you can you can uh, uh, click on, and uh, you can just you can type in you know a, a laryngoscope of an opera singer, and you can get this really nice video that shows a camera being put through the nose of an opera singer and it's located just in the larynx just above the vocal cords and as this opera singer sings you can see the cords uh, the vocal cords um, abducting and adducting so you know moving further apart or closer together that is ultimately resulting in a change in pitch uh, of her voice so let's answer some questions real quick so what is the difference between external and internal respiration uh, what does the pharynx contain or what can it contain? And then what purpose do our sinuses have uh, within our body? So think about those. Uh, you can pause it. You can answer them. And then we'll end here and we'll pick up with part two in a second.